Hi, this is Matt, and in this video we, I am going to explain the difference between deductive and inductive arguments. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put both of these up, and then we'll talk about them. So this is the textbook definition. Notice they are both arguments, so they both have premises that are in intended to give support for conclusions, but the difference is in how they support their conclusions. So notice the definitions of each of these is very similar. Deductive arguments are designed to give logically conclusive support for their conclusions. Inductive arguments are designed to only offer probable support for their conclusions. So the only difference is those words that are in italics in the definitions, whether deductive arguments give logically conclusive support and inductive arguments give probable support. So both kinds of arguments, the premises are designed to support their conclusions. As I said before, the main difference is in how they support their conclusions, whether it's logically conclusive support or probable support. So let me give you some examples, and hopefully this distinction between logically conclusive and probable will be more clear. So here's an example of a deductive argument. Premises 1 and 2 give support for the conclusion, and the way that they do this is by giving logically conclusive support. So what that means is it's like 100% guaranteed support. If it's true that all triangles have three sides and the figure pictured here has three sides, then it has got to be true that the figure is a triangle. There's no way for this conclusion to, be, to turn out to be false. It's just got to be true. All right. Let's look at an example of an inductive argument. Nine out of the last ten college football champions have been from the southeast. Therefore, the next college football champion will be from the southeast. Will probably be from the southeast. Now, this one's very different than the previous one. We don't get any kind of guarantee. This evidence only gives us some sort of probability. For all we know, the premise is true, and the next college football champion will be from the, the northwest. We don't know for sure. So, because you might think of it this way, nobody knows for sure what's going to happen in the future when it comes to college football. We might even not even have a season this year because of COVID-19. But even if that premise is true, it seems like it gives us some support, some historical precedence for people from the Southeast taking college football seriously, so they usually win. So this gives us probable support from the, for the conclusion, but it's very different than the last one. This doesn't give us probable support, support for the conclusion. This gives us logically conclusive support for the conclusion. All right. How do you tell the difference? Well, sometimes we talked about indicator words before in previous videos where indicator words can help you tell whether or not something is an argument. The indicator words can also help you tell whether or not something, an argument, is deductive or inductive. Now, this isn't a, a guarantee. This, this is not infallible. Indicator words might lead you astray because some people might just be mistaken about what kind of argument that they have. So a lot of times, in, inductive arguments will have probably in the conclusion, like we had in this one. The next college football champion will probably be from the southeast. But this is a good first start. Look for indicator words but don't rely 100% on them. The next way you can tell what kind of argument it is, is the form or the style of argument. And I'm gonna go over this in a little bit more detail later, but the book lists out several different kinds or forms or styles of argumentation. And those, if you, if you know what those are, then you can just look at the argument, tell what the form or the style of argumentation is, and you'll know whether it's inductive or deductive just by looking at it. And lastly, you can analyze the actual strength of the inference. So ask yourself, is this are these premises intending to give us conclusive, 100% support for the conclusion, or are they intending only to give us probable support? That's what I mean by the strength of the inference. What are those premises doing? How are they supporting the conclusion? And that's probably the best way to tell if you haven't memorized the forms and styles of argumentation. All right, let's look at some more examples. Here's in the premise is a survey of students. And then we make a conclusion based on that survey. Does that premise give us a guarantee 
No, it doesn't. It doesn't give us a guarantee. For all we know, the students could have been lying. We don't know for sure. So this gives us a probable support. And whenever you see a survey of this kind, the statistical survey, then it's probably going to be an inductive argument. Because it doesn't give us a guarantee, it only gives us probable support for the conclusion. Here is an example of a deductive argument, another example. This one is kind of based on a definition of what it means to be a lawbreaker. If it is true that anybody who cooks meth in New Mexico in an RV is a lawbreaker, then as soon as Walt cooks meth in an RV in New Mexico, then by definition he's a lawbreaker. So definitional kinds of arguments are deductive. All right, this one is a prediction, just like the one about the college football. This one predicts what's going to happen in the future. Every former NBA player I've ever seen has been taller than me. Therefore, the next one's probably going to be taller than me because NBA players, statistically, are really tall. But there's no guarantee. So I've showed you a picture here of Michael Jordan and um, Muggsy Bogues. Muggsy Bogues is a short player. So he's actually shorter than me. Well, it kind of depends on how tall you are, too. But if we're talking about me, I'm six feet tall. So there are NBA players that are shorter than me, but they're few and far between. Most of the NBA is vastly taller than me. So it's, it's likely that the next former NBA player I see is going to be taller than me, but it's not guaranteed. So this is an inductive argument, and it's a prediction, and predictions in general are inductive. All right, now for the kinds or forms of argumentation, and the book has examples of all of these. We've already seen a math-based argument with the triangle argument. Geometry is a kind of math. Don't be mistaken about this, though, because statistics is a kind of math, too, and a lot of statistics-based arguments are inductive. So the math-based arguments I'm talking about are where there's like, you give, you're give you given some evidence, and there's one answer to the question. It's got to be this. Those are the math-based kind of arguments I'm talking about. We've already seen a definitional kind of argument. So many arguments based on the definition of a word are deductive. And syllogisms. We're going to talk about several different kinds of syllogisms. You'll see examples of all these in the book. So let me just say a few words about what a syllogism is. Um, maybe it'll be helpful to think of examples. First, think about what a categorical, a categorical statement is a statement that compares two categories of things. So th something like all dogs are mammals is a categorical statement that compares the category of dogs with the category of mammals. And an argument composed of categorical statements, we could call a categorical syllogism. So all dogs are mammals, all mammals are warm-blooded, therefore all dogs are warm-blooded. So this is an example of a categorical syllogism, and it's deductive based on the kind of argument it is. A hypothetical syllogism is an argument that starts with a hypothetical or a conditional statement, an if-then statement. So you could say something like, if you jump into the pool, then you will get wet. I jumped into the pool. Therefore, I am wet. So that is an example of a hypothetical argument. That's an argument that starts with a hypothetical. A just disjunctive syllogism. A disjunction is just an either-or statement. So disjunctive or disjunction is a fancy logical terminology for an either-or statement. And you can make an argument based on these, where you have the either-or statement as the first premise, and then you rule out one of them. So if you really do only have two options and you rule out one of them, then you're left with the final option. So your professor might tell you, either you turn in your final paper or you will fail this class. And then they say, you didn't turn in your final paper, therefore you are going to fail this class, unfortunately. So if, that's, if, if it is true that you've only got those two options, and we ruled out one of them, you didn't turn in your final paper, then you're left with the, logically, the last option must be true. So this is an example of a disjunctive syllogism. All right, kinds of inductive arguments. We've already talked about predictions. Arguments that make predictions about the future based on what's happened in the past are inductive. Because, I mean, just think about it. Nobody knows the future for sure. So we make predictions that are like educated guesses based on evidence. And some predictions are better than others. Like, I predict I'm going to eat lunch in a little while. Now, that's, that's a pretty good argument because historically just about every day of my life I've eaten lunch so it's probably going to be true that I'm going to eat my lunch that's better than other kinds of predictions like the college football one where maybe it's not quite as strong 
Analogies are arguments that are based on analogies. So an analogy is just a, a way of comparing things um, by describing how it's like something else. Um, and we can construct arguments based on these analogies. So any argument that compares two things within, from one premise to the next and then draws a conclusion based on that comparison is an analogy. Generalizations are special kinds of arguments where we go from specific instances of something occurring to generalizing about the entire class. People make generalizations all the time. And sometimes they're good generalizations and sometimes they're bad. I've observed, and this is the way scientific arguments work a lot of times, you observe a bunch of specific instances of something happening and then you form a generalization. When I took physical science in ninth grade, we dropped ping pong balls from 10 meters high and we observe how long it took for them to reach the bottom. And then we make a generalization that all ping pong balls fall at about the same rate based on the small sample size that we had. So that's another example of generalizations. Arguments from authority are also an inductive argument form. So if you're in an argument with somebody about what happened in, uh, in history, or about some kind of academic subject matter and you point to your textbook as like see here proof the textbook says that this is true so I'm right well that's an argument from authority the reason why it's inductive is sometimes textbooks could have wrong information so it's only inductive it gives us probable support for the conclusion but it's not guaranteed arguments based on signs these could be literal signs like road signs so if you are driving along and you see a road sign that says um, curvy road ahead, then there's probably going to be curvy road ahead. But it's not guaranteed because that sign could have been put there by mistake. So it's inductive. Or it could be metaphorical signs. So if you've ever watched a crime scene show and the crime scene investigators come to the crime scene and they look for signs or clues about what happened. So these aren't literal signs like road signs are, but the clues that they find are signs that give them inductive support for what happened at the crime scene. Oh, one final thing before I close out. Another way of, the, the book describes another way of explaining, or another way of determining whether or not an argument is inductive or deductive, and it's based on the amount of information that's found in the argument. So let me go back to our argument examples. So according to the book, a deductive argument, all the information found in the conclusion is, is already found in the premises. And in an inductive argument, the conclusion gives you new information that is not found in the premises. So let's look at the inductive argument first. So our premise just tells us what's happened in the past, and our conclusion tells us what's going to happen in the future. So our conclusion gives us information that's not found in the premises alone. It's giving us new information. This is something that's typical of an inductive argument. Deductive arguments, on the other hand, all the information in the conclusion is found in the premises. It's kind of like reworded. Same thing for this one. When we surveyed 1,000 students, we didn't survey uh, a majority of college students because there's lots of college students out there in the United States. We only surveyed 1,000 of them. So we didn't survey a majority of them. So our conclusion contains more information than what's found in the premises alone. When we look at our lawbreaker example, all the information that's found in the conclusion, who a law, uh, what a lawbreaker is, who Walt is, is found in these premises. So you can tell the difference between inductive and deductive based on the amount of information that's found in the conclusion, whether or not that information is found in the premises or whether or not we are given new information. Okay, so that's it. Now, we have learned the difference between inductive and deductive. In the next video, we'll talk about what makes a good argument. Validity and strength, soundness and cogency. So stay tuned.